Please visit sleephappia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Register at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. Hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Bradley. Welcome to sleepapnea.org. And today, as part of our speaker series, we're going to discuss the correlation between sleep apnea and the diabetes risk. I'm delighted, as usual, to have uh, Justine Amder with me today. Welcome, Justine. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. And Justine and Teresa have worked tirelessly on some slides that we'll present today just to discuss the link between sleep apnea and diabetes risks in our population. So, Justine, I'm delighted again, like I said, to have you here. And if you'd like to start with the slides, we can go through some of the objectives of today's talk. So we'll reiterate it again, just for our population out there, maybe new members who aren't familiar, but we will discuss what exactly is sleep apnea. Uh, we will discuss what diabetes is and the two types and how are they linked. So there is some research out there that I've been doing over the last couple of weeks when uh, we were working on the slides. So I will refer to some notes and um, some data that I'll present. And we'll bring it back to a personal level as well, where Justine can share experiences with people that she knows that have both um, syndromes. So next slide. So again, sleep apnea, as if we look at it, is, is pauses during our sleep cycles. So basically, when someone is uh, diagnosed with sleep apnea, it's because they, they're stopping breathing and actually cutting off their airway at least five or six times every hour. So for me, actually, for a sleep apnea patient like myself, we talk about the um, apnea hypopnic, hypopnic sorry, index. And when we look at that, my reading was five to 10 um, each hour. So I was having an episode of five to 10 times where I would actually stop breathing. This does lead to hypoxia. So you may have heard that term used before. And hypoxia, just generally speaking, is the shortage of oxygen in the body. It can affect our well-being. It can affect the oxygen to all our organs and brain. And that's why there is a correlation to many comorbidities when we look at sleep apnea. One of the series we did do before, and you want, might want to check it out, is also the link between sleep apnea and hypertension. So hypertension is quite common, unfortunately, in our sleep apnea population. And basically, it is high blood pressure uh, that is uncontrolled, and they feel there is a, a great uh, link between sleep apnea and high blood pressure. Physiological, the terms that we're going to use today, is just normal functions of the living organisms and their part. So if we think about our physiological well-being and we think about good sleep, that's when actually the body repairs itself. I think I said before, a lot of people think that when we're asleep, everything shuts down. But your body is actually a little machine working at night, uh, repairing organs, getting good oxygenation to organs, uh, regulating hormone balance, for example, so that the next day you're waking and up refreshed and ready to tackle um, all that life throws at you. So next slide, please. So when we talk about diabetes, the pancreas is the organ in question, okay? So the pancreas is the organ that converts what we eat as energy, and it converts it into our fuel for our body, uh, it also produces insulin. So insulin is the hormone that's actually made by the pancreas. You'll hear the term insulin resistance. And that's basically usually in type 2 diabetes when the body is actually not producing enough insulin and it's actually resistant to the insulin that it does reduce, therefore leading to an increase in blood sugar. Hyperglycemia is that raised glucose level in the blood. So you'll hear that, hear that term uh, thrown out a lot. And of course, hypoglycemia is the lower end of glucose in your blood. So that can be, both can be actually pretty critical um, 
A lot of times when people have type 1 diabetes and maybe they've overshot their insulin, for example, or they're not eating a regular meal, can actually have episodes of hypoglycemic attacks. It's that feeling of like you may have been gone all day, not eating, not drinking too much, and you just feel off, you feel dizzy, you feel nauseous. That's the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, so that real hunger pang. So next slide, please. Um, I had a quick question. Um, you described some of the feelings that you would have with hypo, correct? Yeah. That's what we just said. Is, is it similar for if you're hyperglycemic? If, if you have a raise, did you, is it the same things that someone would be feeling, um, you know, maybe a little foggy, a little nauseous, or, or is it a different spectrum? You know, it's a great question, Justine, and both are quite similar in their presentation. Uh, the hyperglycemia can actually be, there's a term called ketoacidosis, where the, 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 the body is actually breaking down fat that's stored. Um, and people have that high blood sugar, where you can actually smell it off someone's breath. Actually, it's a phenomenon um, that you know, a doctor or a nurse would diagnose and say someone is in ketoacidosis. So the presentations are quite similar. There's confusion. Um, there's thirst. Uh, there's disorientation. And I guess when I talked, oddly enough, to one of the dietitians recently about this, if someone presents with either hypo or hyperglycemia, but it's not evident at the time, it's best to treat the hypoglycemia if that makes sense, because that actually is more critical when you're not getting that blood and sugar to the brain. Someone can lose consciousness quite quickly. With hyperglycemia, the main treatment would be insulin, of course. Okay. But hypo, you need food. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what we do know is besides many risks of sleep apnea, and you know, we've, we've talked about many of the risks here on our uh, series, diabetes ranks as one of the more, more common ones. Um, it's a co-occurring illness. When I did do some research, um, you know, diabetes is regarded as the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. And, um, you know, the condition can be caused when we look at um, an autoimmune disease that causes uh, diabetes in adolescents, and it's usually regarded as type 1 diabetes, meaning a lot of people are on insulin from an early age, okay? So type 2 diabetes is something that occurs later in life, and it affects probably 80% of the diabetics in our community. And it's the most common, and um, it's generally related to obesity and age. And, of course, we are learning more and more that it's related to sleep apnea, and we'll go into the reasons why later. So there is a lot of people that do have both of these syndromes, sleep apnea and diabetes. The question is sometimes which came first, okay? Okay. And I think we'll explain that later on, or I hope to explain that later on, looking at some of the risks and the characteristics that are um, related to both syndromes. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. Yeah, just to um, talk a little bit about my uh, experience. Um, sure. Most of the people in my on my maternal side of my family have both sleep apnea and diabetes. Usually the diabetes was... Um, <clears throat> at least, you know, all these years ago was found first as the first condition that they had. And then as they got older, sleep apnea came um, into play. Um, but that was kind of before, you know, my mom is in her 70s, my uncle's over 80. Um, they didn't really hear about sleep apnea in their when they were in their 40s, you know, like me. So, so, Justin, you may be um, familiar, the link or part of it may be due to the fact that sleep apnea and diabetes do share some risk factors. And from what I've read, obesity and cardiovascular disease seem to be the top two. So if we look at some of those symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, we can see, you know, obviously we do have excessive daytime sleepiness, fatigue, loud snoring. 
And, you know, any of the research that I did was a lot of those are related to, to just feeling fatigued all the time, not wanting to exercise, overweight, a bit obese, maybe carrying the weight in the mid-abdomen is a high risk for both conditions. And, um, you know, again, unfortunately for men, erectile dysfunction can be a, a symptom of sleep apnea. So, you know, we always see... The two diseases or two syndromes are actually interconnected. And that's why sometimes they feel that there's a lack of understanding of which came first. Does sleep apnea cause diabetes or the fact that you do have diabetes puts you at higher risk of uh, sleep apnea? And later, I think I'll maybe look at some of the studies that I'd looked at that, you know, are out there in some of the uh, research that people had looked into both uh, syndromes and trying to figure out the link. And I'm sure those symptoms are similar to maybe what you've seen in some of your family members, Justine, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, uh, go ahead. No, no, I think, you know, one of the big things too that I, sorry, wanted to uh, look at is obesity is a risk factor for heart disease. And then like I said earlier, heart disease causes actually sleep apnea. And then both syndromes cause type 2 diabetes. So there is that big link and big risk there just through our um, comorbidities that people are experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So go to the next slide. Yep. So some of the symptoms too, I think I touched on some of these with type 2 diabetes is feel like they can never quench their thirst. They're always drinking all the time. Some of that is because the blood sugar and your level, or your, sorry, the blood sugar level is so high that it actually just makes you just want to drink all the time and flush it through almost. It's that um, physiological uh, wake up call to say, I just need this flushed out of my symptom or system. Extreme fatigue is sometimes obviously on both conditions, and we see that a lot with type 2 diabetes especially if it's not controlled very well. So if you think about the food that we get as our energy and it's broken down properly, but if you're not utilizing that energy, it's stored as fat, leading to obesity and lethargy, fatigue, not wanting to exercise. And um, oddly enough, some people, when they're actually initially diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, do lose some weight. And um, there is an instance where, you know, people have experienced lack of control in their sugars uh, that can lead to if you get a normal cut or wound or breakdown in your skin, for example, that it just takes so long to heal. And that, again, just speaks to the fact that the blood is just so engorged with sugar for the want of a better word. And it's not getting all those heal properties to the wound to heal and repair the body. So that can be an indication as well. Some of the other signs that people have said are, you know, red or swollen gums, tingling or numb in the hands or feet, more like the extremities would be what we would call in the medical field as diabetic nephropathy. And um, some people have blurred vision where it's uh, diabetic retinopathy. And so if you're experiencing some of these things, it's time to get a checkup and it's a simple test. A lot of these things are really diagnosed through a simple blood test. And if your sugar or hemoglobin A is good, then it's time to look at um, lifestyle adjustments and or medication. Okay. Any questions, Justine? Um, no, I was just thinking uh, back a little bit. I mentioned before about, um, you know, my mom, and I just remember that, you know, when she uh, was working full time, you know, when I was, um, you know, even in high school or what have you, um, you know, she, she had started to gain a little bit of weight, and that's kind of what pushed her into the whole diabetes realm. Now that she's in her 70s and retired, she's actually, you know, um, um, made a concerted effort to 
um, lose some weight, exercise a little more. I can't say that it is, you know, brought it 100% in check with, uh, you know, in check and has gone away, but um, it's definitely gotten better. Um, so, you know, making those lifestyle choices, at least for her, you know, put her in a, um, put her in a better um, place, you know, with, in order to, in regards to taking medicines and how she was feeling and all that kind of stuff. Sure. And Justin, may I ask, does your mom also have um, obstructive sleep apnea? Yes. Yes, she does. She does. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because we do see that, you know, if you have diabetes, sleep apnea can make it actually difficult to manage your diabetes. Um, and, you know, this is basically that when you're stopping breathing and you're having pauses or fragmented sleep or disruptive sleep, it actually increases the carbon dioxide in your blood. And this leads to insulin resistance. So again, what I said earlier, the body's not repairing itself. Um, it's not getting the nutrients it needs to repair. And during the night when everything should be sorting itself out and repairing for the next day, um, it's not utilizing insulin effectively. So the correlation there is to treat the sleep apnea as well and um, hopefully be as adherent to your therapy as possible. And people and studies that I have seen in the past have actually saw an improvement. In a two-week study that was done out of Chicago, um, most people's blood sugar levels were better maintained if they were adherent to two weeks um, of eight hours each night of uh, their therapy. So it's something to consider for your mom as well. Yeah. Okay. So next slide. And if you do type 1 diabetes or if you do have type 1 diabetes, again, that's something that, um, you know, usually occurs in adolescence and it's usually what we used to regard as insulin dependent diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, it used to be called non-insulin dependent diabetes. That's the diabetes that happens later in life through um, lifestyle, obesity. Now we're learning sleep apnea. And um, again, it's 90% of all diabetic cases and caused basically because the body is not utilizing the insulin as it should. So a lot of people with type 2 diabetes do get some better control with their blood sugar when they are adherent to their CPAP therapy. And we have seen that in some studies that I researched. But again, when you're not and the body has this inflammatory response during the night when sleep is fragmented when you are toxic for example and there's an oxidative level or um, free radicals for the want of a better word um, going through the system then the insulin isn't being utilized as best as it should and that's what causes diabetes later in life there is another sense I know we didn't really touch much on it, but um, some people do develop gestational diabetes during pregnancy. Most people, it happens, and there are risks, of course, to the mom and baby uh, related to gestational diabetes. But they did find in studies related to gestational diabetes that people are at risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in life if they don't make some lifestyle changes. Okay. So we can go to the next slide. So sleep apnea, again, like we said, can influence type 2 diabetes. And, you know, when we look at the, the insufficient sleep alters hormone balance, like I said earlier, and that can lead to weight, can lead to weight gain. It can lead to lack of exercise, lack of motivation, um, sometimes your eating habits are all wrong because you're not sleeping well at night and you make it up and have a snack and try and read something and, you know, get back to sleep again. But generally speaking, you know, increased calories lead to increased weight if you're not exercising and utilizing them properly. And of course, that causes the blood sugar to rise. A decrease in sleep along with obesity can, of course, increase the risk, like I said, of type 2 diabetes. And for some of the people I see in my clinic um, that are mainly kidney patients um, that um, can develop type 1 diabetes that's poorly controlled, unfortunately can lead to um, 
kidney failure, you know, either early in life, I've seen people even in their 20s needing a kidney transplant, or later in life when that sugar just engorges the small vessels in the kidney and the blood and filtration system is compromised. So, you know, there's lots of risks out there for diabetes. And if we think about some of the treatments, sleep apnea and therapy with using your mask every night is something that I feel that if people realize some of the risks down the line, they would be more inclined to go and seek treatment. And doctors out there in their offices, when they see people that fit that uh, demographic of obesity, developing type 2 diabetes, and the risk of snoring should do both. They should do both studies. They should do a panel to check for um, risk of diabetes and also a sleep study to look um, to see if uh, someone is experiencing sleep apnea. Any questions, Justine, regarding that? I was just going to say, you know, my my personal experience with, you know, with my family in regards to type 2 diabetes, you were talking a little bit about, um, <clears throat> you know, eating and food and, and you know, sometimes I, I remember it kind of got into this place of, you know, uh, you're feeling the fatigue, you're feeling the, the, the drag, and so it's uh, something quick with some type of quick carbohydrate sugary thing, you know, that just sends you into that, that consistent cycle. Um, I mean, it's true for all of us, whether you're feeling that way because of, um, you know, a um, insulin issue that's going on or you had a, you know, or not getting a good night's sleep because of apnea or just had a bad night's sleep. You know, sometimes the donut at 2 p.m. in the afternoon sounds like a good idea to give that extra, you know, little boost. But that's, you know, it's, it's, it's important, I think, for people to take note of how they're feeling during the day and, you know, kind of what you're prone to gravitate, uh, you know, towards. And if, you know, um, I think that's a, a sign that people should take back to their doctor when they, when they, when they see him or her. Yeah, of course. Great point. I know, especially nighttime eating, you know, we're looking at things like, you know, whatever you eat at night is you're not really working it off per se, and you're not um, utilizing that energy. So it sort of sits on you all night. And that just leads to increased uh, weight gain, which, of course, we all know is a risk as well for um, sleep apnea. So this graph here is actually quite interesting. And, and when I looked at it, I mean, again, it sort of reiterates what I'd said earlier when we look at sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, which leads to intermittent hypoxia, you know, that starvation of good oxygen to your brain and vital organs. And sleep fragmentation leads to all these different, you know, sympathetic inflammation, oxidative stress, um, hypothalamic pituitary, that's not working properly. And all these can then lead to insulin resistance. Um, and our patients do see that later in life when their obstructive sleep apnea is not well controlled. And it's just another sign and symptom uh, that people should be aware of out there that they may be at risk of developing both if their sleep apnea is not well controlled. Yeah. Any questions regarding that? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, for, you know, decades now, we've been hearing about um, nutrition and exercise. Um, and I, I, you know, within the past 10 years or so, sleep is really taking a, a, a um, become on the same level as that. And it is really important. Um, it's just as important as, you know, as we've said in all the other uh, talks that you and I have had, um, just as important as what you're feeding yourself and, you know, getting out there and, and, and moving around. I mean, it's, 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 it's all an equal playing field. Um, and when you off balance, this is, you know, this is what this graph is showing. Sure. You know, and just to bring it back to some of my patient populations in the kidney donor world, um, if somebody wanted to be a living kidney donor, I, I remember one woman wanted to donate to her husband and um, her ethnic background put her at risk of diabetes plus her weight and her food choices, definitely. And, you know, she actually initially was declined as a suitable donor for borderline sugar. Um, that was elevated, you know, her glucose levels were elevated. 
And she did. She was so committed and she did go and make lifestyle changes. And six months later, all her blood work looked great. You know, and at the time, um, that was not a correlation or a link that I even brought together. Um, you know, it's something moving forward in my practice that I would say to people, if you are at risk and you develop in type 2 diabetes or you're borderline, um, they feel that in the future you may develop it later in life, it is probably worthwhile to um, go and have a sleep study as well um, and ask some questions around their sleep habits. So, you know, lesson learned for us all. But again, lifestyle changes, cutting down on, you know, this lady was having rice actually with three three times a day. Um, and, um, you know, the carbohydrates is like, you know, in our body then is used as sugar and it was yeah. just leading to central obesity and she wasn't really exercising. But once she'd done that for six months, her blood work looked great. Wonderful. So, you know, when we look at glucose levels, they usually hit their peak within about 90 minutes of a meal. Um, and those with type 2 diabetes should keep their um, blood levels around 60 milligrams per deciliter, it's called. So you'll see different parameters out there, different things and different borderlines of sort of where you should be after a meal, where you should be before a meal. But generally speaking, that's a good place to be. And again, like I said, carb carbohydrates are broken down into glucose sugar, which raises the blood sugar level if they're not utilized in, in energy. So reducing that carbohydrate intake um, can help with your blood sugar levels. So a lot of people, you know, you do hear even some of our patients out there say, yeah, I have sugar or I have sugar diabetes. And they do think it's like, you know, I don't eat a lot of sweets. I don't have cakes. I don't have pastries. But think about it as your complex carbohydrates like your rice, your potatoes, you know, anything that's broken down to um, a glucose, which ultimately is used as sugar in the body, will raise those glucose levels. So be mindful of those types of foods uh, will have an impact on your sugar level. Okay. So it's not just the fact that you don't have sweet things or sugar. It's how the bodily body actually utilizes and breaks down carbohydrates. Any questions related to that, Justine? I was going to say, I'm guessing this, the peak that you're talking about is kind of um, that time frame when people might want to take a siesta after a meal <laughs> because you, you know, whether you have it actually at lunch or at dinner, you know, all of a sudden everything is, you know, starting to be processed and, you know, you just come down like, oh, I should take a little bit of a nap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And we've all experienced that. Like you said, you know, you want the 2 p.m. donut or you want instant gratification by something like that's quick and carbohydrate based, for example. And you get that little surge. And then, you know, once the body does take care of it and insulin does happen and, you know, it's utilized, hopefully, then you actually come down again. And sometimes you come down harder than you initially were. And, and these things aren't really pick-me-ups. They're actually, you know, they give you a little boost, but when you come down, you drop a little bit harder. Yep, yep. I think we've all been there yeah. <laughs> with the Snickers bar. That's their whole ad campaign, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, I mean, this slide too, it speaks to some of the things that I have been looking at. And, and, you know, there's not an awful lot of research out there regarding, you know, weight in, in good clinical trials. You know, we all know that there's a risk factor for sleep apnea, especially uh, what we would call central obesity. Um, but definitely what I did read out there is, you know, when there is a good control of your sleep apnea, there was some study again out of, I think it was Chicago. Um, and for those two weeks when they had people that were really adherent to their therapy, their blood glucose level, especially in the morning, um, was found to be actually lower than prior if they weren't really treated well with their sleep apnea. So they feel that the, you know, good therapy with sleep apnea helps repair that body, like I said earlier, and actually helps increase um, insulin resistance. Um, some studies even suggest that the sleep apnea therapy, um, wearing your mask every night, for example, and um, being adherent to it, 
got some people off their medications with lifestyle adjustments, meaning exercise, watching what they eat, um, and um, their sugars were actually far better controlled. Any questions regarding that, Justine? Uh, no, no, I, I, I think it's pretty straightforward. Great. Well, that helps people understand a little bit of the links between um, sleep apnea and diabetes. And sometimes the diabetes comes first and then you're diagnosed with sleep apnea because it is a consequence of maybe you have gained weight, um, maybe you're not exercising, you're not just sleeping right and your eating habits have become not as good as you would like. But it's worthwhile um, looking at both syndromes and thinking, you know, if I have this, then maybe I'm prone for example, if I have diabetes, maybe I am prone to sleep apnea, or certainly with our sleep apnea population out there, it's worth bearing in mind that due to the fact that you have been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, it does seem to put you at higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in life. And diabetes is... Um but uh, like a uh, hereditary disease. I mean, it's, you know, correct. It can be a familiar because I know, like I said, especially with my mom's side of the family, you know, uh, I think out of she's one of five, four of them have it. And of those four, three of them have sleep apnea as well. So, um, you know, we had talked before about how sleep apnea runs in families, you know, yeah. for a variety of reasons. We talked about that with uh, Dr. Lee. And, um, you know, I think it's the same with, with diabetes. And like you're saying, you know, get them, yeah. talk to your doctor about that. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, you know yourself when, when, you know, a lot of times we go into a doctor's office, so part of the um, history taking is your history. And, you know, they want to see what either hereditary diseases could be out there or familial diseases. So, you know, you're more at risk because you're part of that family. The lifestyle is embedded in that family lifestyle, for example, the put you at risk for that or, you know, if there's families out there that are more prone to obesity, for example, and everybody is a bit overweight, then, you know, these things have a familial component. So it's definitely always wise when, you know, you go to a new office or go to a doctor that he does take things like, you know, hire your mom and dad. What disease do they have? Because we're always looking at things to say, does that put you at higher risk? And you're right. There definitely does seem to be a correlation there as well. I do remember also a time where there uh, was this term for my family when you were pre-diabetic. You know, you, do, you weren't really taking any uh, medications. You definitely were not on insulin. But, you know, it was the diet, the exercise, the lifestyle change. And, um, you know, I... Um, Unfortunately, no one in my family was able to grab a hold of those, you know, suggestions and they ended up, you know, further on down the line with medications and or insulin. But, um, you know, there are people, like you said, with your um, living donor that was able to, you know, take those those markers that they had and, and make those changes, you know? Sure. Well, I mean, Justin, you've had a child, so I'm sure that during your pregnancy, you probably had what they call a two-hour glucose oral glucose tolerance test, where they take your baseline blood sugar, and when, when you fasted all night, for example, then they usually give you, I think it's about 75 grams or 100 grams of a glucose drink, and then an hour, and then two hours later, you come back for further blood work. And that's a way of predicting whether you're pre-diabetic or you're, you have type 2 diabetes or not, or gestational diabetes, which will be in the case in the pregnant population. So when you hear that term related, you know, to people being pre-diabetic, it's basically that their blood um, sugar level isn't high to put them into the category of diabetes, but definitely if they don't change their lifestyle, then they will develop it later in life. It's like a predictor, for example. So when you hear that term, I'm pre-diabetic, meaning if you don't, now we look at the correlation between sleep apnea, lifestyle changes, cutting down on your carbs, exercising, losing weight, um, you will be at definitely higher risk of developing diabetes later in life. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. That was some great information. Good. 
Well, as always, Justine, it's always a pleasure having you on board and um, giving us your insight and adding questions and comments. When we do push this live, we will be available in the wings to answer questions and comments that people may have and try and clarify some of the responses there. But again, I want to thank you, Justine, for participating. And um, I hope everybody has a wonderful night and um, take care of each other and yourselves. And as always, sleep well. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleepapnea.org slash donate for details. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And you could check out some of our other videos.